Great. I think we'll get started. Um, I hope you can see me all right. Uh, it's really good that you've uh, been able to join the meeting this evening. And uh, can I just first ask everyone to go on to mute uh, so that we don't get interruptions from dogs and other things. Um, yes, thanks very much for joining. And uh, there's quite a diverse group of people, I think, who are watching tonight. There's uh, certainly some friends and family from the UK. Uh, and there's a group of people from the Corby Facebook, uh, Corby owners page, which I've been part of for a few years. And it's been very helpful in getting to know my Corby through the group. And uh, there are some people who've joined directly through Eventbrite. They've just found this talk on Eventbrite. And there may well be some friends and colleagues from Malawi who are joining. And if they're not joining now, they'll probably watch the recording because it's a bit of a different time time zone for them. So you're all very welcome. And um, I think the plan is that we'll I'll do the talk, which will just be some slides and video an explanation and then we'll have some discussion at the end uh, when we can all turn our mics on and discuss and there's also the zoom chat which should be active uh, which Jane will be monitoring um, so I think let's get started uh, so I'm talking to you talking to you tonight about a trip that I did last year which was to sail solo around Britain uh, in a small boat and this is the boat you can see on the screen which is called it's a it's a Corby 21 and the name of the boat is Mwera and uh, that is the name of the prevailing wind that blows on Lake Malawi uh, from about the southeast during the middle part of the year and it can be quite strong sometimes getting up to four six maybe maybe gusting seven so it certainly makes some, exci some exciting sailing on Lake Malawi. And I chose it for the name of, of my boat. So the talk tonight, there's going to be quite a lot of intro and background uh, because I think it's quite important for people to appreciate what the trip was about. And then the trip is almost the second half of the talk. So, but I hope you'll find the first bit just as interesting. Um, So there's quite a few people who didn't really know that I was a sailor, but I did actually get into sailing quite a long time ago. These pictures are taken from my grandparents' house uh, on the south coast in a village called Hillhead, which is somewhere between Southampton and Portsmouth. And uh, this is my granddad in the Can yellow... Can you help me now? In the yellow oilskin. And uh, my father there doing something with the boat there. And uh, this is a boat we went and did day trips across to the Isle of Wight on uh, when I was growing up. And these two young lads here, they're not me, but uh, they could have been a few years later. In fact, those are I think my cousins pushing that dinghy up the beach on a roller. Uh, and a few years later, it would have been me doing much the same thing. In Malawi, I also had a boat. I built a, uh, a day boat called a Scruffy 16 which was a 16 foot day boat with a, a lug sail and sailed that on Lake Malawi uh, with the family and also did quite a lot of exploration uh, on my own as well. So where did the round Britain idea come from? Well, there were a couple of guys that inspired me over the last few years. And I guess the, the dream has been there maybe for 10 years and then the preparation for the actual reality has been about for the last five years on and off and this guy Dylan Winter who's based on the Deben River in Suffolk uh, he had a vlog which wasn't on YouTube at the time it was sort of pre YouTube channels uh, and he basically every season he would move on to a different section of the coast uh, going anti-clockwise and explore all the harbours and the rivers and uh, show filming of the bird life and the history and so on and it was a really interesting uh, interesting blog and this guy Roger Taylor who uh, sailed a Corby but he had a, a Chinese style junk rig sail rather than the, the more traditional Bermudan sail and uh, 
he sort of perfected the art of minimal ocean sailing. So his philosophy was that you could take a small boat and if it was equipped properly uh, for all conditions, then you could do great, inv- great adventures, small <laughs> boat. So uh, he was also, oh. and he wrote a few books about that, which I've read at least twice, I think. Yeah, so the Corby itself has quite a pedigree. Ellen MacArthur sailed hers around Britain as one of her first big sailing trips. At the bottom, we have Guy Waits on his Corby called Betsy, uh, in which he sailed across the Atlantic and back again uh, during a Jester Challenge. He's now around round the world, Golden Globe sort of sailor. And the other boat is a 16-year-old who sailed around the UK in his Corby a few years ago. <clears throat> so I got the I got mine boat in 2018. It was at the time it was called Lady Quick, uh, built in 1978. So quite an old boat, as they all are. And uh, she was sort of uh, reasonably well equipped, but certainly not ready for big, uh, big expeditions. So I had quite a lot of work to do to get her ready. And uh, the nice thing is in Sheffield, where we live. There is space at the top of our drive to store a boat. So in the winter, uh, we get a local farmer to reverse the boat up the drive for us, which is quite a skillful job. It's very narrow. And uh, I have the boat on the drive just at the top here. And this is the garage where my workshop is. So I'm able to work on the boat during the close, the out of season months uh, and uh, have free storage there. And so in 2020, when I had actually originally planned to do the Round Britain chip trip, uh, I, I did a, I started doing a lot of the work on the boat and had this uh, tarpaulin over the top. And um, there I am hiding in the stern locker doing something or other. And I had a whole spreadsheet of jobs to do for every system on the boat. And... Um, I won't show you the spending tab on that one because uh, boats always swallow up money like anything. But I'll just take you through a few, a uh, small selection of some of the modifications that I did. So I fitted a solar panel off the stern on the sort of solar arch and put in a new electrical system, new switchboard, a solar charger, a uh, new battery and so on. And uh, rewired the whole boat and put some USB charging in. And basically the whole boat runs off 12 volts. This is a waterproof tablet that I use for navigation. So that's just on a hinged mount there. So I can see it in the cockpit. And then I put in a new VHF radio and an AIS receiver, which can show you where other boats are around you uh, in the dark or in the fog and so on. I did put in a hookup for the mains, but I've never had to use it because the solar power has always been sufficient. <clears throat> This is where I cook on a boat. The, the stove is called the galley. And this is a spirit stove that runs off bioethanol. And I made some little... Um, forgotten what you call them now, but things so that the stove can swing. Um, I don't know why I've forgotten it, but anyway. Just cooking up a little uh, snack on the go. Some quick uh, noodles. That's my stove. Just to see. And gimbals, that's the word. Thank you, gimbals. And... Uh, on a, on a boat, the, the toilet is called the heads, and the heads, when I got uh, Moira, or Lady Quick as she was, had this chemical toilet, which was under this square cushion in the middle here. But I wanted that space for some other storage, so I went to the more traditional bucket and chuck it version of the heads, which has worked very well. I did a big repainting job, stripping off all the anti-fouling on the underneath, uh, and went on to do a copper coat anti-fouling. Uh, which is a big job, but I think it's worth it in the end. And then repainted the top sides uh, so that it looks quite smart now. This is Oxford blue and looks quite smart. The other thing I built is this contraption here mounted on the stern, which is called a wind vane. The moment it's cocked up out of the water, but usually it's hanging down in the water. Uh, and this can basically take over the steering of the boat uh, just for as long as you want, as long as the winds are fairly steady. Uh, and it's not too rough. So I've sailed a whole 24 hour passage with basically the wind vane steering the whole trip and I'm just doing other things. It's been very successful. 
in 2020, I did manage to do a short, well, a shorter trip up the East Coast from the Deben River up to Holy Island, Lindisfarne and back. And in 22, when we came back from Malawi, I did a trip from the Humber down to London and up the Thames to St. Catherine Docks and back. Uh, so I got a bit of time in and managed to test the systems and the modifications and think of a few more to do before uh, setting off on the main trip. So at last, uh, 2023 came round and uh, it was time to, to take on the circumnavigation of Britain, which is roughly 1,800 nautical miles. Now, I think not everybody on the call is necessarily a sailor, so I should just say that on the sea, certainly in the UK, we measure the distance in nautical miles. A nautical mile is a bit longer than a, a land statute mile, and it's about 1.8 kilometres. In terms of speed, you measure the speed on the water in knots, which is one, uh, one knot is one nautical mile per hour. So that will make more sense of things later on. When you decide to go around Britain, you have to decide on anti-clockwise or clockwise, but somehow I'd set myself on the anti-clockwise route. But you can, if you're very sort of pedantic, go around the whole British Isles, including Shetland, Ireland, the Isles of Scilly, and you can even take in some of the Channel Islands if you want to. Uh, but going on the west coast of Ireland can be difficult because you get the full brunt of the Atlantic weather coming in and it can hold you up. So I chose to do sailing around Britain, where you go around the top of Scotland and then come down the Irish Sea. And uh, some people either don't want to go around the top of Scotland, uh, it is a bit bleaker up there, or they want to go through the Caledonian Canal and they do a slightly shorter version. So this is now the track of exactly what I did, my round Britain trip. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about tides. And forgive me if I'm teaching my grandmother to suck eggs here, but uh, just a bit of explanation about tides for, to get everyone on board. And then I'm going to talk a bit about passage planning as well. So I'm sure most of us know that when you're at the sea in, around England, around the UK, you see the tide going in and out. You see the water retreating from the beach or you see the water dropping in a harbour. And there's a continual cycle every six hours of the water tide coming in and going out again. But what this translates to out at sea when you're along the coast is actually a movement of water like a river. So if you're in the North Sea, when the tide is, um, where's my point to come? When the tide is coming in, it's actually running from the north of Scotland down the North Sea towards Dover for six hours. And then the whole North Sea is filling up with water. And then the next six hours, it's running north in the other direction and back out towards the Atlantic like that. So it's, it means basically there's always some sort of river current flowing, which is the, called the tidal stream. And it can be along the coast at maybe one to two knots speed. And this is quite significant because if your boat, like Muera's average speed is four knots, then if you're going against the tide, as the tide is flying, flowing south, you're trying to go north, you'll only be going over the ground at, at two knots, which is pretty slow. And uh, if you're going with the tide, you might be going at six knots, so it makes a big difference. And where this tidal stream fl flows past headlands like uh, say Flamborough, Flamborough Head, which is around here somewhere, or the Portland Bill on the south coast, you can get very fast tides and quite rough water called overfalls or tidal race where you get standing waves. And certainly on Portland Bill, they can be big enough to sink a boat. So a knowledge of an understanding of what the tides are doing is fundamental to this trip. And actually, the whole rhythm of the trip really is based around the tides, even more than the wind. Uh, if the tides say that you should set off at two in the morning, that's when you set off. Or if it's five in the afternoon, that's when you set off. And instead of the sort of nine to five standard working rhythm that we have, it's, it's more about the tide times. The whole of the UK is also surrounded by buoys, which we know are round or cylindrical or cone-shaped floats in the water which mark the channels where it's safe to travel, it, they mark 
uh, sandbanks and wrecks and other obstacles. Uh, and you really have to know what the boys are telling you as you go along uh, in order to find your way safely. In some areas, you have quite a lot of commercial traffic, like coming out of the Humber or the Bristol Channel or around from Liverpool. And you have to be aware that there are big tankers or container ships coming along, which are going a lot faster. They may be going at 20 knot speed and they come down on you very quickly, even though you first see them quite a long way away. And often you have to ask permission from the VTS who control the traffic on the sea. Uh, you have to ask permission from them to cross the channel where the main shipping goes. Another big hazard all around the UK coast is lobster pots or crab pots. And there are literally thousands and thousands of them everywhere. And they're very, they have quite long ropes that often hang in the water and it's easy to get caught up in them with your propeller or your rudder or something. So plenty of hazards there to you need to know about. So for navigation, I used a large scale sort of passage making charts to get an overall picture of where I was going to go. And for day to day navigation on board, I was using a, a tablet, which is a waterproof tablet, and it has all the charts on and some software that helps you to plan your course and uh, assess your progress and so on. And I also had a tracker, an inReach tracker. This was quite an old model that I got from eBay. And this basically sends out a signal of your position every few minutes and people can follow where you are on an online map. So you just get a link and open up the map. And it's also a safety thing. It means that uh, at the bottom there, there's a red button, SOS button, which sends out a international rescue call and your position is also sent out so people know exactly where you are. On this trip, it actually just created a whole subsystem of life where people who are following me on a small WhatsApp group are also following the tracker and it becomes a little bit addictive. So sometimes if I was up too far off to have a mobile signal, uh, people would be chatting away about what I was up to, how fast I was going, what my plans might be. And when I got into harbour, I'd find there'd been a whole discussion about my passage uh, that I wasn't aware of. But uh, it, uh, it, it actually contributed a lot to the fun of the and participation by people in, in the trip. So a passage is a day sailing from A to B. And it might be five miles, it might be 100 miles. And passage planning is a very big part of each day of sailing because of the tides and the winds and other obstacles. And you have a thing called an almanac, uh, which tells you all about tide times and heights and currents and buoys and all sorts of other information. It's absolutely packed with information. And then you have pilot guides, which tell you about pilotage is navigation by direct vision. When you're near the land, you can see obstacles, you can see landmarks like lighthouses, uh, and when you're navigating with those visual things, that's called pilotage. And these books are full of information about how to get in and out of harbours and anchorages. And, uh, you know, it's a bit like a climbing guide or a walking guide. It just gives you all the information that you need to do it safely. And this website, which is called Visit My Harbour, has all this information as well in slightly different format. And uh, that I used all those different things for passage planning. So I actually devised a pro forma. Uh, don't be anxious, I'm not going to ask you to fill this in or anything, but uh, this is a pro forma that I devised and it's, I'm sure, like a lot of other people use. And um, I'd fill one of these in for each day or trip that I did. So I'm just going to take you through one of them just to give you an idea of what's involved in, uh, in passage planning. And I'm sure people who sail a lot will look at this and see things to discuss or to question me about. But this was a trip on the 14th of July, going from Plymouth to Dartmouth. Uh, and up here, I say, I, was, I measured on the chart, it was a 40 mile trip. Here I have the weather. So it's starting off as a force three southerly wind, which is quite light. But by what I knew when I did this trip was that by eight, nine o'clock the next morning, there was gonna be a force eight gale blowing. And I partly wanted to get to Dartmouth overnight uh, ahead of that gale. Over the other corner you have the tide times, so this is Plymouth and this is the Dart River Dart, 
and you have 0330 in the morning, that's high tide, that's the height of the tide, and then 10 o'clock it's low tide, and you have that information, and you have some information about the tidal stream on the coast there, what time it's flowing. And I have a planned departure time for midnight, and hope to get to the river dart by, by nine. And over here I have the VHF radio channel number for the dart harbour master, so I can call him up when I get in. And then the really bit that takes a lot of time is, is collating all the information for this table here. And uh, don't be anxious, I'm just going to take you through it column by column. And I think uh, you understand it, and it's, I think it's quite interesting. So I've got here the times from midnight up to nine in the morning. And then from my almanac, or another tidal atlas, I get information about the, the tide, what the tide will be doing each hour that I'm sailing. And here, the first hour when I set off at midnight, the tide will be doing half a knot, 0 0.5 of a knot against me. So when I go out, I'll be heading into 0 0.5 knot of a tide. The same for the second hour. When I get to the third hour, the tide has changed. It's now coming in and I get 0 0.3 knots of tide with me. And then the next hour, it's 0 0.5 then it's 0 0.9, 0 0.8 and so on. So that is the tidal stream that I'll experience. And because there's a good breeze, I'm estimating that my average boat speed will be 4.5 knots, a bit faster than average, but there's a good wind blowing. And then you basically add these two together every hour, and that will tell you how far you're going to travel in that hour. So in the first hour, I'm going to be going at 4.5 knots, but I'll have a tide against me of 0 0.5. So I will cover four miles at the end of the first hour, I'll have covered four miles. The second hour is the same, so I, I cover another four, and that makes, this is the cumulative column here, that makes a total of eight. In the third one, I've actually got 0.3 of a knot with me, so I'll cover 4.8 miles. The next hour, five, and so on, and so on. And you add these all up, and when this total in this column is the same as the distance that you've measured on the chart, then you've arrived at your destination. And that is really how you plan the timing of your trip according to what the tide is doing, whether it's with you or against you. And here I've had quite a lot of assistance because most of my trip I've had tide with me. And this line I've written, I'm in the river, meaning that I've arrived in the dart, not that I've fallen in the river. Here I just put some little extra notes, like here I've put push out, meaning that I wanted to head out to sea when I left harbour rather than hugging the coast. Here I've put overfalls, that's when I go round the headland, that'll be some rough water, so I should stay a little bit further out. Uh, here I've put a note that the visitors' moorings in the river are white boys with a black V on them, so I can easily recognise them when I get there. Because I've been sailing all night from midnight till nine in the morning, so it's good to have all this information just ready to, ready to hand. I hope you're with me so far. It's a bit heavy duty. It probably wasn't what you signed up for tonight, but uh, it's nearly over. So the green is the actual what happened. So I actually set off at 10 to midnight, but I did get in about nine o'clock. And I make a little comment here that the plan worked out nicely. I had to motor sail a bit at the beginning, and then I flew down the strait to the river. And at the bottom, this is just a record of how much motoring and how much sailing I did. So that is my daily passage planning chart. I do one of those every day. And I'll just show you another passage in a slightly different way. Um, this was earlier on in the trip where I was crossing from northeast Scotland to the Orkney Islands here. And this is crossing a rather notorious bit of uh, water called the Pentland Firth. So this is the chart of the area. The brown is land and the white is the sea. And this water that you have to cross to get to the Orkney Islands at the north here is called the Pentland Firth. And because when the tide is flowing, it comes up the North Sea and tries to squeeze through this gap. It flows very fast and it's also quite rough. And this is a blown up version there. When you see these wiggly lines on the chart, that tells you there's going to be overfalls or a tidal race, uh, standing waves. And uh, there'll be a note about it here that you can read. So at maximum tide, you actually have up to nine or 10 knots of tide flowing through this gap. 
So if I just came up from the headland here to try to cross over with nine knots of tide, I would just be swept off to the west without even making it across into Orkney and vice versa if I was going the other way. So you can't cross when the tide is flowing at maximum. And what you have to do then is follow cross at what you call slack water. That's when the tide has finished going one way, hasn't quite started going the other way yet. And you're at that in between time when there's very little current as you cross over here. So you have to get to Duncansby Head at slack water and then you, it's about an hour to cross here. And during that time, the tide is minimal. And if I went three hours later, it would be a very different story indeed. So in fact, as I got to this part here, the tide was starting to flow west. And I was actually pointing about 60 degrees towards Norway in order to be swept up the channel here without bumping into the island. So the tide did get going. Right, so I've done some boat preparation. I've done some passage planning and uh, I've learned about all the tides and so on. It's now time for me to set off on the trip. So here I've towed the boat to Grimsby with a hire van. Uh, Jane had organised a nice send-off from the family for me, and uh, here I am, leaving the harbour in Grimsby. See ya. See ya to get. It feel almost unreal that I was finally setting off. Yeah, it's the first Next of stop's Burn Head. And uh, after so many years thinking about it and all the COVID uncertainty, but it was great just to be on my way. So because I'd spent quite a lot of time sailing on the east coast of England already in previous years, I decided I want to make a bit of a head start and get moving north quite quickly. And I decided to do the 230 miles to Edinburgh almost in one go with a brief stop in the River Tyne. And having had a sh uh, when I left Grimsby, I had a, a short night at Spurn Head and set off early in the morning uh, and got up to the River Tyne here. And you can anchor just inside the harbour walls there. It's quite sheltered. And my son, who's studying in Edinburgh, Peter, he got the train down and joined me on the boat. And then we went up to Edinburgh together, which was quite nice. It meant we could share the watches during the night and get some sleep. Uh, and it was fun to have some company on the boat. So here he is. This is looking down the ladder when I pulled into the fish key to pick him up. He was carrying two boxes of fish and chips as well, I'm pleased to say. And uh, here we are on the boat. And we had a, quite a strong wind behind us, but it was behind us and we were just surfing along the waves nicely. And uh, this is Bass Rock, which as you get near the Firth of Forth going into Edinburgh, you have Bass Rock there, which is covered in seabirds and there's a gannet flying along in the foreground there. This was early in the morning, about 6.30, just as we were coming up to make the turn into the Firth of Forth. Uh, it's just been a lovely night of sailing rolling along and got into Edinburgh and had two nights there just to catch up on some sleep uh, and uh, some friends Trevor and Franny had us over for supper and uh, even though it was early May they still managed to do a barbecue and give us a steak supper which was very nice and then the next part of the trip was to basically hop my way up the east coast of Scotland from harbour to harbour, aiming to be in Wick by the 14th of May, because that's when the tides would be, it would be neat tides, it would be the best time for, to make the crossing over to Orkney. And uh, so I'll just give you a little flavour of some of the harbours as I went through them. What happened on this uh, part of the trip was that it was quite a lot of fog and drizzle, and it was a bit cold, and what the Scots called dreek, and uh, so when I got to Anster or Anstruther, I was quite excited. Hi everyone, I've just found the crew room which is available to visiting yachties. It's warm, heated, dry, cooking facilities, showers, washing machine, and an appropriate song on the radio. Cheers everybody. So that was nice. And then I got to uh, Arbroath after that, which is quite famous for its Arbroath Smokies. 
So instead of your fish and chips coming in batter, it comes with smoked fish, which I was sort of, I think I prefer the batter ones myself, but I uh, had to try it. You can see it's raining. I've got this boom tent over the where are giving me some shelter in the cockpit. Uh, for those that know, this is a Turk's head knot that I was working on to put on my tiller, just something to while away the time. After that, it was to Stonehaven, which uh, there's no pontoons here. It's more of a working harbour, but you do basically tie up inside the harbour wall there. And here I am coming in. I'd phoned ahead to the harbour master and he told me to moor over in the corner uh, near that fishing boat that you can just see. So I came in there pretty much high tide. And... Um, the difference about mooring up to the harbour wall rather than the pontoon is that when the tide goes out, you have to make sure your mooring lines are long enough so that the boat can go down with the water. Otherwise, it's left hanging there uh, on its ropes. Uh, well, that's the best outcome, probably. Fortunately, I've got lots of old climbing ropes, which are long and stretchy and very good for mooring with. So I'm using one there to tie up. That's me tied up on the wall there. And uh, I did a nice walk along the cliffs down south to Dunrotta Castle and uh, had a nice time. Next stop was White Hills, uh, which is now round the corner on the Moray Firth on that bit of Scotland after Aberdeen that's looking facing due north. And this was something of a pilgrimage because this was the harbour that Roger Taylor, who practiced the art of minimal sailing, this is where he set off for on his big Arctic exploration trips that he did in his Corby, going off for maybe 70 or 80 days, I think, uh, up north. And he didn't have an engine on his boat, so he was always towed in and out of harbour by the harbour master, who's called Bertie Milne. And they were very good friends. And I thought it would really be really great to go in there and see where, where I'd read about in the books. The harbour master often stands on the end of the harbour wall here to welcome you in if you radioed ahead to say you're coming in. Which, uh, he was there when I came in. So here I am just tied up on a pontoon and very generously he only charged me for one night even though I stayed for two. And I took a bit of time here to do the passage planning for crossing the Pentland Firth which was coming up in two days time and did a few repairs on the mast uh, and uh, quite a nice snug little harbour there. And then I set off and got to Wick. And uh, this was really just a, a stepping stone for Orkney. So I left Wick at about, I think it was about 4.30 in the morning, getting to Duncansby Head here by 7.30, which is then slack water. And here I am. Here we go on our way to Orkney. Lovely force three, force four wind, and uh, happy skipper. Morning, everybody. These little films are just from the WhatsApp group that I was sharing with people. So this is me now coming into the southern part of Orkney, which is really centred around Scarpa Flow. There, quite a well-known area of water, Scarpa Flow, because this is where the navy was stationed during the first and second world wars. And there are quite a lot of wrecks, both uh, British and German boats in Scapa Flow, and people go up there to dive on them. And there's a lot of wartime history uh, around this area. There's quite a good museum at Linus here. So I basically just did some short little trips exploring my way around uh, Scapa Flow. And uh, this was me in the Lirawa Bay, which I hoped was going to be sheltered, but actually it was quite windy. And I did have a little trip ashore there. And, uh, and then basically chilled in the cabin for most of the afternoon. Uh, next, I went over to the east side of Scapa Flow to visit St Mary's Church. And this was built out of two Nissan huts, these round topped huts that were around a lot in the war. And they got permission to build it. And they did decorated it all on the inside, uh, somehow plastered it and then did the decoration. And it's really beautifully done. I think this has been refurbished since the, it was first done during the war. So that was nice. And then after a few more stops, I got to Stromness, which is the main town 
uh, for the southern part of Orkney. And having been a week on anchor, it was a nice time to get a shower and do some washing and uh, get some provisions in and basically preparing myself for the next part of the trip, which was quite a big section. There's my provisions in. And the next part was to go across from Stromness around Cape Roth. Cape Roth isn't an angry cape, it just means a turning point. Uh, but people often think it's something to do with being rough and angry. And this is the next bit we're going to talk about. So quite a long crossing to Cape Roth, and then basically hopping my way down from one lock anchorage to another. And every day having to head out against westerly winds around these headlands, which essentially was quite, it was quite hard work having to sort of motor sail out for two or three hours sometimes, and then thankfully turn south and start sailing. And so I had some good sailing once I got out. The trip across from Stromness to Cape Roth was pretty epic. The, um, basically, there were westerly winds forecast for the next week or 10 days, which would completely stop me from making the journey. And but the Sunday at the beginning of that time, uh, there were light winds and they were more favourable. So I decided to, to go for it. And I sailed probably for the first two or three hours. And after that, I had to motor almost the whole trip, which was pretty tedious. And I started feeling the Atlantic swells rolling in, quite big swells, and I got seasick for about six hours. Uh, so it was pretty hard work. But uh, this is me leaving Stromness at four in the morning, just to avoid the tidal race in the, in the sound, and uh, just leaving Hoy behind me. Here's the old man of Hoy. I know Tom Escort's on this call, and him, uh, myself, and someone else climbed this about 30-odd years ago and stood right on the top there somewhere. So uh, didn't see any climbers out on this day there. Uh, quite big swells coming by. And then this is Cape Roth itself. Uh, I took a slightly wide berth because it was a bit rough. I didn't want to get caught in rough water close in. And now I could head south and another uh, well-known sea stack and Bukail. Uh, and then I eventually came into Lock Laxford for at about half 11 at night, I think it was, just getting just getting dark. Uh, it just was dark as I came in. Good morning, all. Just thought I'd give you a little taster of where I came into last night at the end of my rather long epic passage from Stromness. It's a pretty epic passage. As you come around Cape Roth, you've got the big Atlantic swell rolling in. And as it reaches the shore, it's all crashing into the cliffs all the way down. So you get this amazing sort of wave scenery as you come down and come into the lock. And then uh, once you're in, it's all nice and peaceful. Heard a cuckoo this morning. And uh, I'm just planning to move to a slightly more sheltered anchorage in the next hour or two. Great, so then I moved to Lock uh, Cadfi, uh, just nearby. When I was a teenager, I went to an outward bound centre just at the head of the lock here for two weeks, which was run by a, an ex para called John Ridgeway. And it was a fairly hardcore outward bound week, but great fun. And uh, there I am on anchor. And this is his yacht, uh, English Rose 4, that he did quite a lot of big ocean sailing on. It's now just uh, up on the hard there, not being used. <coughs> So the next section of the trip from Cape Roth heading down the west coast here was really the part where I planned to um, put the most time into exploring. It's, it's well known as a very good, tra uh, very good cruising area. The only disadvantage is that it, it often rains a lot. But I was fortunate to have pretty much three weeks without rain and favourable winds, mainly winds with, that were northerly, which basically helped me along. And uh, so I had a fantastic time. I visited, well, I did 18 passages, so visited about 18 different places. And uh, I'll just take you through that. So this is just heading further south from Locker Cadfrey. This is Storehead, also has the Old Man of Store, which is also a climbable sea stack. And this was coming into Lock U after going round, going past the Old Man of Store there. 
just a lovely evening coming into the anchorage here in Lock U. A long day, about 50 miles, but uh, managed some nice sailing. And then at the, at the end of this section, I came to Plockton, which is a lovely sheltered harbour. And uh, I had an orthopaedic colleague that I'd met uh, during some exams a few months before who said, oh, do come and get in touch when you get to Plockton. You never quite know whether people mean that or not, but I decided to take him at his word. And uh, here I am on Moira. And uh, this is Kevin, who then looked after me, uh, gave me some supper the night I arrived and then went to his, his cottage in the morning, had some breakfast and had a shower, did some washing, did some passage planning together and uh, helped me with a few other things. So uh, I, I stayed there for two nights and had a, a good rest. And from here, I'm basically going to head around the inside of Sky, past Carl Lockalsh, Carl Ray, uh, the Narrows there, and then head out for about a week to the Western Isles uh, for some, ex some exploring. I wasn't sure whether I'd get out there, but uh, conditions were favourable. So this is the Sky Bridge, and coming down behind me was this beautiful gaff rig cutter, uh, followed me down, eventually overtook me uh, halfway down the Sound. And I came around the south end of Sky and then up <coughs> to uh, an anchorage called Loch Scave, which is in here. And it has this beautiful backdrop of the Culin Ridge Mountains, which are well known uh, by mountaineers and climbers. And uh, this is in the anchorage. You get an idea of how big a corby is compared to the yachts that a lot of people sail. And we're tucked in there. Beautiful spot. There's a little landing stage. And there's a climber's hut there, which I think belongs to the Glasgow Climbing Club. So that actually had some... Lots of climbers gear in it, but they were out for the day when I stuck my nose in. And I did a little walk around the freshwater lock, just slightly higher up, Lock Karushk, uh, and that's looking up onto the Kulin Ridge there. From that anchorage, I then went, did a 40 mile crossing overnight to the Western Isles and came into Wizard Pool. And this is a little, this is me anchored over by the island there, and another really sheltered spot lots and lots of fish farms everywhere very well marked and there's a sort of perimeter boys that stop you from getting too close and then uh, this is boysdale harbour a bit further south and uh, i thought i should give you a taste of bagpipes since we're in scotland <laughs> this boat was doing some sort of pilgrimage around the UK and stopping off and having little services, little ceremonies on the pontoon and wherever they stopped. From there I went to an island a bit further south called Eriske and uh, there was a very noisy group of seals on the rocks uh, that morning and to me they sounded a bit like goats when the, when the male goat is in season and all this groaning and howling noises and I was looking on the hillside for the goats, but only to realise it was these seals on the on the rocks there. When you go up to the top of the island and drop down on the, to the Atlantic side, you find that there's a beautiful white beaches and really surprisingly spectacular uh, coastal scenery. I had this little oven, little stovetop oven called an Omnia, which you can bake bread in. So I did a bit of that. And... Uh, just to highlight another nice, this is one of my favourite anchorages on this part of the trip. This is um, Eriske, where I'd come from, Boysdale Harbour is there. And there's, these two islands have this little pool of water in between them, Helise and Gihe, and they form a little pool there which you can get into if you have, particularly if you have the Antares charts, which are little mini chartlets that help you navigate some of these places. Uh, and this is just spectacular. You can see the sand here where I've anchored. All the dark areas, water is kelp, uh, so hard to anchor in. But I found a nice anchorage there. And when the tide went out, it was just a metre depth, which is pretty much what the same as my boat. 
So that was just a really special place. And some nice spring flowers, uh, irises and uh, orchids. And eventually it was time to head back east again. And I came in past Staffa, went through Iona Sound, and I'll come back to that, and Loch Tarbert, and then down uh, Isla Sound into Port Ellen. And that would be the end of my uh, west coast of Scotland exploration. So I came in past Staffa, which is quite a famous island with these basalt com columns that are quite unusual. And it has the famous Fingal's Cave, which has inspired poems and uh, classical music and so on. So I stopped off there, found a place where I could get the anchor onto the sand again, and then brought my dinghy into the landing stage. Uh, from there, I went down and uh, came down Iona Sound. Iona is quite famous for the sort of Celtic Christianity uh, base that's there, and this is Iona Abbey. Uh, I was there for the weekend, so I did go into the, the Sunday service and uh, found a really nice anchorage. It wasn't quite Tinker's Hole, but it's near to where Tinker's Hole is, and tucked in, tucked in to, between some small islands, and these kayakers are having a nice time. And then eventually I got to uh, Port Ellen on the south side of Isla, and you can tell the island is a big um, whiskey distilling island because there's a this enormous grain hopper right on the harbour which keeps all those distilleries going. So from there I'm now going to head south and do some longish passages heading south, uh, briefly going into Belfast Lock uh, and then getting to the Isle of Man. And um, this is me in Bangor Harbour in Belfast Lock. You can see I've done some washing and got my sleeping bag out to air, uh, making making the most of some fine weather day. And met up with these guys, uh, Neil and Sarah Kennedy, who uh, we knew from Malawi, and we had a nice meal together. And from there I went on to the Isle of Man, into Peel Harbour on the west side of the Isle of Man. Uh, it's quite fun to visit the island. It's one of the oldest democracies in the world and uh, is much more independent from the UK than I realised. So uh, that was, it was interesting to go there. This is just outside the harbour. As I came in, I had to anchor because the harbour gate was closed. And the nice thing was that Jane came to join me. She got the ferry over from Liverpool and came and joined me on the boat for four days. So we had some fun exploring, uh, cycling and walking and so on. Uh, more orchids and uh, some repairs. I'd, you have a light on the mast, an anchor light, which had got knocked off by one of the halyards when I was in Loch Torridon. And I bought one through the, one of the Facebook groups, which Jane brought, brought up for me. So I was fitting that. And um, from there, I've really got to start making some distance now. The Isle of Man was my halfway point. Uh, in terms of time and distance. In fact, I think I've done a bit more than halfway in terms of distance, but certainly time-wise, it was pretty much my halfway point. And I felt quite a lot of pressure now to cover some miles. So I went down to Hollyhead and then skipped all the way down Cardigan Bay to the Pembrokeshire area and then all the way across to uh, Cornwall. I had wanted to go into Bristol but it's a big detour, which should probably have added an extra week to the trip. So I, I omitted to do that. But um, around Pembrokeshire, there was a bit more that I did that doesn't come out on the first map. So I came into Solva and then visited Skoma, which is uh, a well-known bird sanctuary, and then came into Milford Haven for a night, just waiting for the weather to calm down a bit before I made the big crossing to Cornwall. This is just the skies as I left the Isle of Man and this is um, Hollyhead Marina which was completely devastated I think in 2017 by a massive storm a hurricane that blew through and hundreds of boats were sunk and pontoons were destroyed and uh, they're sort of functional again but still you can see all the quite a lot of evidence of the damage uh, ubiquitous uh, oyster catchers 
And then I left uh, Hollyhead and had a long sail of over 100 miles down to Pembrokeshire. And this was the morning after my night passage on that trip. Well, it may be a long passage, but it's turning out to be fantastic sailing so far. I think they've been sailing for the last 10 hours. And uh, just beautiful conditions, not too rough. Good breeze. Making pretty really good speed. The tide's about to turn in my favour as well, so I'm doing about five. So I had hoped to see some whales on my trip round, but uh, I was a little bit early in the season. I think it's more July, August, where you can see quite a lot of whales in Scotland. But I did see a lot of dolphins, and they really are special. I managed to get some underwater footage, and I hope that's going to come out all right. Yeah. So they rush out. Somehow they just see that you're there, and they come rushing out to the boat full of energy and just play around and uh, there's so much energy and enthusiasm that it really cheers you up, especially when you're flying. sure all the sailors amongst us know just how how fun it is when they decide to come and join you for a bit when you're on a trip. So at the end of that passage, after about 24 hours, I came into Solva Harbour, which is a lovely river harbour, uh, full of water at high tide and then at low tide, uh, it empties right out and you're on the sand. And these friends, Terry and Tom, came to visit from fairly nearby and took me out for a day to St David's and we had a, a nice time together. From there, I hadn't initially planned to, but I decided to stop at Skoma, the uh, sort of what, a bird sanctuary island, just a bit south from there. And it's quite hard to photograph birds on a boat that's rocking around in the swell, but here's a seal that's, they often pretend not to be looking at you when they are just close by watching you. Uh, and then some puffins on the water and puffins on the, cliff top there next to their burrows and um, that was quite fun and then from there I had one of my roughest bits of sailing when there was about a 4-6 blowing from the west and I wanted to just go around the corner into Milford Haven to wait for that to blow through so I could set off for Cornwall and uh, it was a reasonably exciting sail. You see I just got a small bit of Genoa out and no mainsail and still making good speed. So here I am on my passage from Skomer Island to Dale. Um, it's fairly rough, force five to force six, but uh, going with the wind and the waves, I've just got a small bit of Genoa out and no mainsail at all. As I reach the headland that you can see on the left side there, I have to jive, which means swap the sail to the other side of the boat and I, initially I tried to use a tiller pilot to do this to take control of the steering whilst I handle all the lines but a couple of big waves in succession overpower the tiller pilot and uh, get a rather exciting surf down the wave and then um, swerve around and the jib backs it's a bit like dinghy sailing sometimes, from where it's just so near the water. So here we go, just got to sort the jib out and get the course lined up again, get the wind in the jib properly, and then do a nice controlled jibe, taking in the starboard sheet there on the winch, and releasing the one on the other side uh, in a controlled fashion. Side. 
taking the other. You let it all flap a lot, then you just get tangled at the front, so you just do it nice in a controlled way, and all is good. In case you're wondering, I am clipped into the boat at this point. So I made it into Milford Haven from there and then set it another long passage down to Padstow. Um, it was quite a culture shock going from Scotland to Ireland to the Isle of Man to Wales and then to be in Cornwall so quickly with the accents changing completely as you move along. And Jonathan, who was following me on the track, had managed to catch me on the harbour webcam just as I was coming into the harbour, which was very clever. And here I am moored up on the harbour wall there. And this is out in the river outside the harbour and then the Doom Bar, which is quite notorious in rough weather, caused people a lot of problems. Um, and there I went further, a bit further down the coast of St Ives, which is just a lovely harbour, another drying harbour, and uh, had a night there. And there I am on the, on, the, on the sand. And the bottom's looking nice and clean. Hopefully the copper coat doing its job for me. And then time to go round Land's End, which was quite an exciting trip in itself, into Newlyn, and then round the Lizard to Falmouth, across to Plymouth, overnight into the River Dart, and then round Portland Bell into Weymouth, where I picked up my son Tom, and then Swanage and Studland Bay, and then through the Solent. So that's where we're going now. And this is just looking into the Dart, which is a beautiful view in past the castle there on the left and looking up to all the white houses, catching the sun on the hillside. And I went up as far as Dittisham, which is about two or three miles upstream. And we used to go on holiday to one of these cottages and do a lot of dinghy sailing in the river. And that's where I got a visitor's mooring for a couple of nights. Picked up Tom in Weymouth and you can see now beautiful south coast weather, t-shirts, sunshine, clear skies and a nice breeze. And uh, we went across to Swanage initially. These are the cliffs at Swanage, which are brilliant for rock climbing. And this was, well, my other son's there as well, Peter taking the picture, but we were out there on, doing some climbing on those same cliffs a few years ago. And then you come into Studland Bay, past the chalk cliffs there. And um, I had been to Studland when I was very young, three or four or something, but obviously didn't remember it. And uh, it's a well-known anchorage. There's a uh, um, old Harry rocks on the head on the end of the cliff there, and then a beautiful sunset over the over the anchorage in Southern Bay. <clears throat> From there, we went into the Solent. This is the Needles going up the Needles Channel there, and uh, my friend caught me on the webcam coming up the Needles Channel doing a nice speed. I think we had a strong tide carrying us in there we might be doing seven or eight knots over the ground i think and this is now the house where my grand grandparents used to live and this is the beach where i showed you right at the beginning with two my cousins trying to push a dinghy up the slope on the on the roller so that was just a little nostalgic pass by uh, an old haunt when i got to chichester uh, Another friend came down from Oxford for the day with his son and we did a lovely sail in the morning in Chichester Harbour before having lunch together. Uh, it was great fun. You can see Chris there looking pretty happy on the helm. Um, there's the heron there on the mud as I was leaving. From Chichester, time to push on up the channel. I stopped at Shoreham near Brighton and then went past Dungeness, which was probably the bleakest headland I encountered on the trip. Uh, made it into Ramsgate. And uh, at Shoreham Harbour, I met up with uh, some family and friends, Jane's uh, brother and wife, and then Kyle and Liz, who I knew from Malawi. And we had supper together. And then I didn't see the White Cliffs of Dover because I went past them at three in the morning. But these are the Seven Sisters, which are sort of between Brighton and uh, just further along from east from Brighton. And then there's Beachy Head, which is quite well known for a variety of reasons and uh, from there I ended up into Ramsgate and turn the corner and get into some more familiar territory from me I've sailed on the east coast here quite a bit 
Um, last year, I was the year before, I was down going up the Thames estuary and so on. So it really felt like I was on home ground now. Crossing the Thames estuary is quite in this direction is a bit of a challenge because all the channels between the sandbanks run in the opposite direction, and you're crossing from Ramsgate across this way. Uh, you have to plan your passage quite carefully so as not to go aground on any of these sandbanks, which plenty of people have done. But I managed that safely. And then it was one of those days where sometimes you set the boat up and it's not too rough. There's a nice breeze. And it's just like the boat's going along on rails. It's just sailing itself. And you don't have to do anything. You're just along for the ride. And it was like that for most of the day. So just a really, it's a really good feeling, which sailors will, will appreciate. This is in the Deben River, where I've been in quite a bit. Uh, nice, it's a lovely place to go into, and not too challenging in a shallow in a shallow draft boat to get over the bar into the river. Then up round the top of Norfolk to Blakeney. Blakeney is really it's a big sand harbour, and at high water, all this sand is covered in water, and you just have the spit here, uh, which is dry land sheltering the inner part of the uh, harbour there. So you come in through the channel and there are thousands of seals there. I think I had a look today. There's several thousand pups born every year. And you go in past them on the sandbanks and then come into this green beacon, which tells you that's where visitors can anchor. And when you anchor there, you're basically on the sand for the night. And um, so there I was. And now really we're almost home and the talk is almost done. You'll be pleased to hear. So this crossing from Blakeney up to the Humber, I've done it a few times now, and it's usually, usually quite a rough, difficult passage with lots of tides uh, and quite rough water. So I crossed over there, and I knew that I had to be back in Grimsby at the end for the 30th, which was the Sunday, because I knew there was going to be a welcoming party. So I actually had a day spare in my planning in case of unforeseen things happening. So I came into the Humber on the Saturday the 29th and went up to this anchorage at the chimneys. And then on my last day morning, I just had to sail down to HCA Marina at Grimsby. That's where I anchored off for the night at the chimneys anchorage. And then here I am. Gone through all the things I've gone through with Myra, big seas, long passages, amazing uh, places. So it was exciting. I, I wasn't sad to be finishing. I think I'd done what I set out to do. It had gone well without any major disasters. And it was just exciting to have achieved that and to have a nice brisk sail back into harbour and know that the family were waiting there for me. So I came in and then, amazingly, both my sons, Tom and Pete, were both in the country and also available to come to Grimsby for the day with Jane. And I had a nice welcome banner. You can see I'm wrapped up in. Uh, my dad was there. And then, of course, a bottle of bubbly to celebrate. So there we go. Court goes off and Basi wow tali wata. That's in Chichewa, that means... That's it. The long journey is over. Thank you, Mwera. So that's pretty much it. My last slide really is some statistics from the trip, which I'll leave up for a little bit because I think people will be interested to see those and it may stimulate some questions. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'm sorry, it's never quite the same as when you're giving the talk in face to face. And... Uh, I had a message from Jane halfway through that I need to I need to be less flat, but um, it's been great to share it with you, and I hope we can have some interesting questions or discussion. Uh, I'll just get rid of that screen now, so I can see you. And there you all are again.
Great. So I don't know what the chat's been like. I haven't obviously had a chance to look at that, but uh, do people have any questions, anything they want to ask or comment on? <laughs> we are in bed. Trevor and Franny, you're well, in bed. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're in Sydney, Australia, mate. Hey, you. <laughs> Lovely talk. We got up at seven o'clock, six o'clock in the morning to listen to you. Okay. These are the guys. Yeah, these are the guys from Edinburgh who gave us a steak supper in <laughs> early May last year. It was absolutely brilliant. Your talk. I'm full of admiration for you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So it sounds like you were a, an ex climber then as well. Yes. Yes, many years. Well, about two two and a half three decades ago, I was heavily into climbing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, you were talking about the old man of Hoy. Um, some climbing friends of mine uh, actually climbed it uh, a couple of years before I sort of met up with them. Uh, it's, it's quite a quite an undertaking, I think. Yes, uh, the climbing isn't isn't too difficult. There's just one pitch that's difficult, but the fact that you when you get to the top, it's not much bigger than a dining room table that you're yes, standing on, and uh, then you have to abseil off again. Yeah, I think the grade is quite sort of um, easy going, but uh, it can be a bit sort of slippery, maybe. And yes, and you have the. I think the they have some galls as well, some fulmars. So, uh, fulmars, which from the yeah. back of their throat, they spit out this fishy oh, goo yeah. in your face. Projectile. Uh, <laughs> yes. Projectile. Yes. I learnt that what you do when you the get to the ledge, you spit at them before they spit at you. Oh, okay. and they're so shocked that they. <laughs> yes. No yes. Yes. There's a, a question from somebody called Mark, um, who said, "Great talk. I find my coronary cramped for even a single evening. Was it hard living in such a tiny space?" Yes, it is a small. It's a it's sitting room only in the back half of the cabin. In the front half, you can't even sit. It's you bump your head if you forget how low the roof is, but. I spent a lot of time when I was in the cabin actually sitting on the cabin sole in between the bunks there and that, it, that was quite comfortable but it is a small space but somehow I found that just for me on my own that was okay. I don't know whether Mark is, is taller than me but I think if you were more than six foot it would be pretty pretty awkward. Right. I can confirm that the Corrie B is small inside. <laughs> You don't get a much smaller. I think Corby's the only yacht that when you get on board from a pontoon, you step down onto a Corby. That's right. Every yeah. other yacht you step up yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. Yes, well, yes, yes, great talk. It was, it was just, it was just absolutely wonderful. What was great. the most frightening part? Well, there were two bits. They both involved headlands. One was leaving um, the Firth of Forth from Anster around to Arbroath, and I. I went, it's called Fife Nest, you go around. And it wasn't, it wasn't predicted or forecast or anything, but there were incredibly violent tidal race. And the bow was sort of plunging into the waves completely and coming up. And uh, it wasn't dangerous, but it was just really hard work. And Land's End was similar. At the very last, well, fairly last minute, I decided to take an inside route around Land's End. I could see where the I can see Andrew shaking his head there. <laughs> I, I could see where the overfalls were, and I thought I'd actually be able to go inside of them, but I actually sort of got drawn into them. And for 10 minutes or so, I was just in the cockpit holding on tight, trusting the boat to get me through. And uh, you could see the lookout station on Land's End, the NSI place, and I thought they must be looking at me thinking, what is that idiot doing in his small boat going through the overfalls? Did you have the same trouble playing around the lizard as well? No, I, I stayed further off and it, it wasn't so rough that time. Yeah. I did, I did, uh, I mean, I'd been careful on all the headlands, but for some reason, I just took this rash last minute decision to go, to go inside long ships and um, it was a mistake. Yeah. But I don't think the boat was at risk. It was just, uh, it was yeah. just a bit exciting. We had a rough time uh, last summer in a, how about Rassi 36? So I can imagine what it's like in a 21 foot. Yeah, yeah. 
Great talk, uh, Jez. Um, what, what's it like crossing the big shipping channels, sort of going across Port of Dover and Felixstowe and Harwich and so on? Do you, do you, do you find yourself like in a group of small boats who are waiting the, the, the moment to, to go or, or no, I mean, is it just once a time? Most of the time, there weren't that many people around. I was, most of my sailing was a bit early in the season. Um, and uh, I didn't find even the Humber, which has a lot of traffic. It, it's not like there's a continuous stream and you really have to wait for ages to get a crossing. You may just see one boat that's just gone past and another one far enough away that you've got time to get in. I think right. Dover is the one where the boats aren't following a specific channel and there are a lot of ferries. So that is yeah. the one where you have to call up the Dover on the radio and get permission. And they often tell you to wait somewhere by a buoy. And that's the one where you really, it really is the busiest, I think, and the most unpredictable. But okay. uh, I think a lot of people, a lot of yachts just go across the shipping channel and hope they're not spotted. But I think, <laughs> I think the other people who are in charge quite like you to be respectful. So I tried to call them up and t tell them that I was crossing over. And once or twice, you just get asked to wait for five minutes whilst the boat goes past. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Anyway, it was really good. Thank, Thank you, you so much for sharing it all. Great. So this is a question from uh, McCreels. Yes. What did you eat for breakfast and what was your culinary specialty? <laughs> what did I eat for breakfast? Apart from digestive biscuits, which I ate all the time. Um, I usually had I had some sort of muesli cereal going on. I used long life milk, and it's surprising how well things keep on a boat if, for two or three days because it's still reasonably cool. And I kept some of my milk and things down in the bilges, in the keel, in the keel, so they're actually underwater or virtually. So I think I had either some bread or or cereal for breakfast, and um, I. Uh, I did quite a lot, initially did quite a lot of cooking in a pressure cooker, so you just bung in a bit of meat, a bit of a tin of tomatoes and some pasta or rice and cook it all together in a pressure cooker, and that gives you food for two nights. But I got a bit bored of that sort of mush, um, so I went on just to cooking more simple things, just some vegetable rice. And I did have a little barbecue, a cob barbecue, which you can put on the deck and it doesn't get hot. So I had quite a few nice little brise. That was probably my best meals you didn't uh, catch any fish on the way around then for no the funny thing is that when you're sailing well it's a bit too fast to catch things like mackerel and sometimes you pull in the line and find there are sort of shreds of a fish remaining on the hooks and i'm not massively fond of mackerel but i i didn't really have time to sort of fish for other things so I don't know if it'd be different if you were with other people, you'd perhaps just be happy to potter along slowly and chat and fish, but I did a little bit. Slows you down as well, doesn't it? For having it slows you down. You have to slow down to fish, I think, yeah. I caught one just as I was going into Boysdale Harbour, and then there was a sudden squall came through, and I basically just had to throw it away because the, the boat was, had more pressing needs than catching fish. That's good fish. Oh. I enjoy seeing you in uh, Solver, Jez. Yes, that's great. And um, right. getting a day in the life of. <laughs> but um, yeah, just to ask what you're going to do next. Is that fair? That's very fair. <laughs> so this year, the guy, Kevin, who hosted me when I was in Plotton, has offered me one of his moorings there for the summer. So actually at the end of April, beginning of May, I'm taking the boat up to Plotton and going to have it based there for the summer. And I'll probably do a circumnavigation round Sky and some other local exploration there. Um, in the longer term, I would like to go around Ireland as a separate, separate trip. And I have to read a bit more about what it's like going around the West Coast. But you do hear of people getting stuck in harbour with bad weather for a week or two at times. But I think it's very beautiful. So, so I did, I did realise that I wouldn't want to do... I don't know how many people know about the Jester Challenge, which is small boat sailing, doing big, not really races, but just trips across to the Azores or even across to the States. 
but I did realize I didn't really want to spend weeks on end on a corabie without getting off uh, on ocean sailing, partly for the crampness and partly just for being away from home for that length of time. I'm actually um, sailing to the Azores this year with the Jesters. Are you? Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, were you funny. there in uh, the Western Supermare? You probably were. Yes, yes. yes I was. Did you go? Yeah, I was there as well, but... I didn't see you. It's quite <laughs> a crowd. There you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I shall be uh, heading down towards Plymouth uh, for June. Nice. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. How big's your boat? It's a contest of 32, so it's slightly over the 30-foot limit, but uh, um, I emailed uh, Roger Taylor, and he said, yeah, no problem. So uh, okay. so that's uh, I've been uh, frantically uh, getting everything finished over this winter, ready for it. So uh, I'm working my way through the very long list. I'm almost there. <laughs> so, yeah. I'd be interested if you could share his email address with me because I, I, I think he stays near Plotton somewhere. I'm not sure, but yeah, I can, I can, um, yeah. If, I can probably find his email and uh, send it across to yeah, you. That'd be nice, thanks. No worries. Excellent. Oh, and thank you, for, thank you for a great talk, by the way. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, cheers. Yeah. I don't know how it was. There's obviously, there was quite a lot of explanation about things that some people are very familiar with, but... I yeah, that... that's fine. I, I understand that there's probably a big cross-section of people, yeah. sailors, some not sailors, <laughs> so uh, that's fine. It was all uh, explained very well, so that's that's good. Yeah. Any, any comments on my passage planning? Do you, do people do something? Uh, actually, I, something I, thought, I thought the, um, I thought <clears> the printout <throat> um, chart that you uh, did each day, <clears> I was actually pretty interested with that, so I thought yeah. that would be a good idea, so... Uh, on my, do you have a, a a document or a PDF or something of that? Yeah, or, yeah, uh, it's just a it's just a word document or an Excel document. I can share it. Yeah, be, be interested to uh, get a <laughs> copy if it's, if it's possible. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah, I thought the passage planning uh, document was a really good idea. Very thorough. Mm. Um, yeah. I think um, I think I suppose I think especially because I had a Corby as well, and now I've got a Westerly Fulmar, and I definitely notice a difference in like what you can do in terms of. I can do much far more passage planning sort of underway on the bigger yes. boat because it's just the space and it's more comfortable and mm. doesn't move around quite so much. Um, but yeah, I think I thought I thought they were really a really good idea just to have it all mm. completely sorted before you before you start on a form that reminds you what you need to write down when you're getting up at three in the morning after having not slept. It's just good to have that prompt, isn't it? So, I think it's part of the surgeon in me uh, just liking to plan for big, well, yes. big procedures, yeah. which sometimes you do for a week beforehand. So, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Chris is laughing. <laughs> there's all of the... There's all of the various um, many P, 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 P phrases, isn't there, about, um, you know proper planning preventing so on and so preventing forth but yeah poor performance yes yeah yeah no no so I, th I thought they were good and also I, I i thought your descriptions of all of the sort of technical stuff around sailing was was brilliant i thought it was really clear and uh yeah struck a really good balance between i'm sure it was understandable to anyone who, who's less familiar with it but it made it made it all made sense so yeah yeah i thought nice. it was a great talk really enjoyed it thank you For anyone a bit more nerdy about sailing, I have got a, a small YouTube channel called Corby Muera, and I'm putting some films up with a bit more footage from the trip. So, um, yeah. Oh, I've just seen the email. Check that out. Yeah. Oh, I'm still. It is still. Okay. Well, I've just sent you Roger's email, by the way. Yeah, I saw that. Thanks. Right. Any other comments or questions? So you had a, you had a, a, a you didn't have a fin keel, you had a... Bilge keels, yeah. Was that a, did that cause you any sort of issues at all? I don't think so. I mean, people always say you don't go so well to win with, with bilge keels. Um, but I didn't, I didn't do a lot of tacking. If I, if it was a headwind, I was either going to wait or 
if I had to get around a headland, I would sort of motor sail uh, and you get the best of both, really. But um, I, I mean, I like it, the fact that you can just take the ground and if you get your yeah. timing wrong, you know, I have inadvertently ended up on the mud in the Humber and also somewhere just near Canby Island before. And uh, so it gets you, you know, you don't end up lying up for six hours. It gets you out of trouble, yeah. So I, I like the Bill's Keels, actually. Yeah, my Corrie B was a my was a keel, yeah. and I actually uh, beached it accidentally when I was in the Menai uh, Straits. Mm. So uh, yeah, that was that was an interesting day. <laughs> At least if you've got a bilge keel, you, you can pretend that you were uh, meant to do that. <laughs> but if yeah. you're in a fin keeler, it's obvious you didn't mean to end up on the sand. <clears throat> no, there's but something. You, brilliant about this sort of um just yeah being able to dry out places in a build kill yeah. boat it's just ma it's magical somehow isn't it you know it, yeah it's a wonderful thing um jez i know you mentioned it but um i've just dropped the um the, the link to your youtube channel in the comments if anyone would like to cut and paste it okay. it's easily it's easily found via the usual search engines but yeah. i've uh, i've dropped the link in there nice. for anyone so, so just a, a question about going up the mast yeah um, how, how f is that frightening? I mean, is it possible to uh, tip the boat over? Or is there a sort of maximum weight you can be before you can go up the mast? I mean, if you do, if you, I remember as a kid on a topper dinghy, if you, we used to have competitions to try and climb up the mast before you capsize. Uh, but on a yacht with the ballast that you have in the keels, you don't really feel unsteady at all, even in a small boat. I, I never felt like she was going to sort of drop me and you know heel over and drop me in the water so um i just used a climbing rope which i pulled up to the top of the mast with the main halyard and then yeah. had had some jumars for climbing and my climbing an old climbing harness that uh, uh i'm not using for climbing anymore so it's so it's, i don't think i don't i mean i'm i'm a climber so i don't find being up there and it's not exactly very high on a corby anyway so mm. Um, when you see them going up the masts on the ocean racing boats and they're sort of tens of metres off the, off, the, off the deck, it's, uh, I'm sure that's quite scary and quite dangerous because you can get bashed around on the mast when the boat's rolling around. So you mentioned Tinker's Hole uh, yeah. in passing. Did you, you, have you been there before? Not before, no, but it's sort of quite well known. Yeah. You know, when you browse through different resources, you pick yeah, up some of the top anchorages. It's just a wonderful place, yeah. The nice thing with it with me, because I could get into some shallower, so I got into a slightly shallower, shallow area, just a bit north, uh, where it's perhaps just a couple of metres or something. And um, But a very nice spot. Yeah. Nice. I think I think my favourite uh, mooring up there was on Eriske, on the, on the east side of Eriske. And... Uh, did you go into that little sea lock there? Yeah. Yeah, really nice, isn't it? That's really. where all the seals were. Yeah. Seeming to be goats. And you walk across to the, um, the, the pub, uh, the, the politician. Did you go to the politician I pub? find the pub, actually, no. All right. <laughs> Well-known <laughs> pub. Right. Yeah. It wasn't in my pilot book. Was it in yours, or how did you know about it? It's, it's, it's a story about whiskey galore, because that's where the... The ship sort of foundered, and all this, all this whiskey got uh, oh. by the locals. Several films about it. Mm. So it's, that, that was the name of the ship, the politician. Okay. Is Margaret? You need to un Margaret. You need to unmute your. Am I, can you uh -huh. hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yes. Um, I just want to apologise for the <laughs> performance at the beginning. Peter is nearly blind and, yes. and nearly deaf. I couldn't communicate with him at all. Um, yes. So it was a bit of a problem. Which no problem, Margaret, don't worry. Out of my hands. <laughs> no problem. But all I want, 
to say is what wonderful photography you 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 made, you managed you know the amazing scenes that you mm. filmed thank you and it couldn't have been easy at some point no if, hopefully if you take enough pictures in, with modern digital cameras you get one that comes out okay right so are you going to um put them in on print them any of them um probably not good christmas cards good christmas cards okay <laughs> i take i take the hint <laughs> <laughs> And, and Jane, how is she? Jane's well. She's sort of in the other room managing things in the background for me. Well, well done, Jane. That's all I can say. Mm, thank you. Did everyone get onto the link okay? It wasn't a problem? Uh, me? Mm, well, generally. Uh, no, uh, it, except <laughs> my hearing aid ran out at the wrong moment as well. Yeah. <laughs> It was just a series of disasters. <laughs> <laughs> but never mind. Never mind, it was fine. It's uh, all part of hmm. Well, do feel free to leave uh, if, you've, if you feel it's time to move on. It's uh, been great seeing you all. Any other questions or comments or discussion, then we can carry on. But uh, great. It's well, I think been... you've done a marvellous job and we're all proud of you. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, I'd like to know, Jess, which was your favourite anchorage, favourite overnight? Because that's always something that I really love in my boat, is just sort of getting somewhere, dropping the anchor, you know, enjoying the nature and the solitude and all that sort of stuff. So which was your favourite favorite anchorage? Well, certainly the one, the little one between Gihei and Harise that I showed out on the mm. box, just near, near south of Eriske, that was... Um, that was one of the top ones. Solva Harbour was pretty un unexpected. I wasn't expecting that to be, uh, I didn't know what it was like. I hadn't read much about it, but that was a pretty special place. Um, and uh, even the one that I came into, which was Loch Akadfri, right in the north, when I came around Cape Ross, that was just really wild and rugged. And had its, had its own and probably quite welcome as well, I would have thought, by, after that passage, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I actually came into a little bay called Fanagmore Bay, okay. actually in Loch Laxford, and um, I tried to pick up a, a mooring, it just there was a boy there, and I, I tied up to it, and then I got into bed, and half an hour later I could hear the barnacles scraping on the hull, and the boy was sort of tipped over, and so then I had to put an anchor down there I just i just threw an anchor over and it was very calm so i wasn't going to go anywhere mm. and, and that's why i moved the next morning but um yeah it's difficult to to pick a, a one single favorite i have to give you give you a selection yeah i think that's fair enough i think yeah. i think yeah yeah no, no. excellent thank you mm. great okay shall we call it a yeah. night then yeah. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thanks very much. Really yeah. nice to see you as well. People all over the country. Great. Well, well done. Cheers. Bye. Yeah, very well done, Jim. Absolutely Bye. brilliant. Okay.